working not just mechanical engineers, although the master's in advanced manufacturing and design is within the MIT Department of Mechanical Engineering, but we realized that many engineers from different disciplines, chemical engineering, materials engineering, aerospace, et cetera, go into manufacturing, but often the principles, what we call the principles of manufacturing are not taught in the undergraduate curriculum. And so we, of course, had this graduate program, but there's only so many people we can admit, of course. And so this opportunity to reach out to the world through an online offering presented itself and we were excited to do so. And so we realized we could educate more engineers about the principles of manufacturing. We're also interested in not just educating engineers in manufacturing, but making sure that they are excellent engineers and as a result, create a centers of excellence in manufacturing, not only here in the US, but around the world because manufacturing touches every aspect of our lives. And we also think it's important that we connect with the rest of the world. MIT is not an island unto itself. It's part of a larger higher education ecosystem. And so we wanted to encourage other universities to develop their manufacturing uh, curriculum, or at least be able to connect with them at a peer level and to the extent that we can share resources and help each other out. Because again, we can't do everything and our uh, peer universities can't do everything. We can accomplish more together. And so you'll see some of these uh, aspects um, came, uh, are realized through some of our partnerships. Of course, the reason you're here is that uh, you're wondering about how this connects to the admissions process here at MIT. And you know, a significant reason why we started this program is to do exactly this, is to connect to the MIT admissions process. Because we realize that there's several, um, there's lots and lots of students that perhaps don't apply to MIT because they don't feel they are ready or prepared or they don't have the background or might not even know about the program itself. And by providing an opportunity to do the courses first and hopefully giving you an opportunity to do well in them, help you realize that yes, you can accomplish MIT level work um, by going through these process and encourage you to apply. And so this connection or in additional opportunities to the MNG admissions process is actually a significant reason why we did this. And lastly, let's not forget that we also want to enhance our residential teaching on an ongoing basis. This is part of what we do. And um, that's you know, my primary responsibility is of course to our students and primary primary, if you will, is our residential students and of course uh, you as well. Okay. So, defining principles of manufacturing, you probably have seen these principles from my colleague, David Hart, or my other uh, faculty colleagues, but we're looking at the uncertainties that come from flow, um, variation, and cost at different levels of the organization or product, right? So, obviously, at the unit process, at the product level, here we're talking mostly around quality, and of course, um, 2830, uh, Professor David Hart's course focuses on that area. Factory level, what uh, Stan Gershwin uh, discusses, supply chain level, and the company level. The uncertainties that come at each one of these levels create different challenges. And manufacturing is not just about the creating the creation of individual products or the design and distribution, but it's everything, right? It's thinking about how the product you're designing and then producing is going to meet customer needs. And then how do you get into customers' hands? And then in order to meet customer needs and get into customers' hands, you have to think about how you actually organize an organization, in this case, a company usually, um, to be able to do that well, effectively, and sustainably. And I mean sustainably, not only economically, but also, of course, now environmentally, which is very important. And so that is fundamentally uh, what the principles of manufacturing are all about, how to meet customer demand and be globally competitive. And at the same time, while we're doing this, 
be able to improve the industry as a whole. So let's talk a little bit about the MEng, and then we'll connect it back to the MicroMasters. The Masters of Engineering, or MN, just call it here at MIT, is a 12-month professional degree. It is, as I mentioned, housed in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. And we started about 20 years ago with the mission to prepare students to assume a role in technical leadership in the manufacturing industry. It's entirely focused on practitioners, students like you, students that are out there doing the work and want to go back and do the work some more. That's different than, let's say, our Master of Science degrees, which are two years, as opposed to 12 months, or our PhD programs, which are focused on research. Here, all the work is focused on the practical implementation of the concepts from the class into the industry. And it's based on, of course, the principles of manufacturing. But in addition, we then talk about the specific technologies and the different industry practices that coalesce and come together to create a technical leadership decision. 12 months, it starts in September. It ends at the end of August, and it's an intense 12-month program, residential program, I should say, um, here at MIT. Now, the way it connects to the MicroMasters is that the first semester of classes is equivalent to what you're taking as part of the MicroMasters, right? And so it cuts out that first fall semester where um, saves obviously the tuition, which at MIT every semester, I believe now is about $28,000. And the living expenses of living here in Cambridge, which is quite expensive um, on the order of about three to $4,000 a month. Right? So we also realize there's obstacles, financial obstacles for some students in be being able to apply for a program like this. This MicroMasters and this connection to the edX program allows more people to apply. Ultimately, that's what we're looking for is to have more people be part of this experience. Okay, so the, as I mentioned, this 12 month program focuses on product level, market level, factory level, and company level. Uh, that is the MicroMasters, right? And what you see in the online program is actually eight classes. But if it hasn't become obvious, these eight classes are actually the equivalent of four full-time um, classes here uh, during the semester at MIT. But because of the logistics of teaching online, we broke up each of these MIT courses into two parts. And for the most part, you can think of part one and part two following each other. But you can also take some of most of these courses independently, with the exception, I would say, perhaps of 2830 and maybe 2854, um, where they do follow each other uh, very closely. And having the background from one is almost necessary in two. It has been done where someone starts with two and does okay. But I recommend at least for those courses, you can start, you should start with one. Um, and for the others, I think you can start in uh, one or two. Now this is the fall semester, right? The equivalent from the MH. Now connecting it to the curriculum here on campus, as you can see here on the screen, what's in blue are those classes that are part of the MicroMasters. And then what's in black are the additional courses that have to be completed in order for uh, a student to get the Masters of Engineering here at MIT. So we focus obviously on the manufacturing physics in uh, like everything here at MIT is numbers, right? So manufacturing materials and processes is 2810. Uh, and then you might also be able to take a manufacturing or design elective focused again on the physics of the materials or the um, or the components of manufacturing. Uh, the manufacturing systems, we mostly talk about that in 2854 and 15762 and 763, uh, but also the design and product development class is part of what we consider the manufacturing system. And so that's also uh, additional course that's required for the MNG. Uh, and then 
the uh, professional seminar to AAA, which is focused on global manufacturing, innovation, and entrepreneurship. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, because it brings everything together, is the thesis that it's done at a company site with two other students. So it's a group, a group of three students working together in a company outside of MIT, implementing what they've learned here in the classroom to a problem or a significant opportunity at a company. And it can be in Massachusetts or outside of Massachusetts, definitely here in the US. We've had a, a few opportunities to send students abroad, but not for the full thesis. It's been here in the US, mostly in Massachusetts, but now California, and we're looking at Michigan, Illinois, and a few other places. I don't expect that we're going to be having any sites or company sites outside of the US anytime soon, but um, you never know, right? So these courses that are in black are usually the courses that the students take in the spring. Every year is a little bit different, but for the most part, you can anticipate that if you do the MicroMasters and finish the MicroMasters, you have finished the fall semester, which are those, again, courses in blue. And then the spring semester is 2810, 2739, 2888, and a design or manufacturing elective. And it's also during the spring semester, which starts in February, and it goes through uh, May and then the summer, when you start your thesis. So most students uh, start their thesis in actually the last couple of weeks of January, and then continue through one day a week, working with a company, sometimes via Zoom, sometimes visiting them in person uh, from February to May, and then they're full-time at the company during August, okay? So um, I've already covered this uh, and, and this. And so again, connecting it back now to uh, MNG admissions, uh, you already know what the MicroMasters is about, but I wanted to emphasize a couple of things here that I think um, are important. Obviously, we're talking about the uh, MicroMasters leading to MIT admission, right? But we have several other universities, 14 as a matter of fact, that we consider pathway universities. These are uh, universities that have agreed to take the equivalent of one semester and apply it for their own degrees. And here are just six of those universities that have agreed to do that. And so it's, MIT is not the only option. If you're in a different part of the world and you, know, you can't come here to Massachusetts for any reason, definitely take a look at these pathway universities because you might find something locally or something much more convenient or perhaps even more um, more economical in a sense, but they have different types of degrees. Some of them are management and business degrees, industrial engineering degrees, and a few are manufacturing uh, postgraduate degrees as well. So I highly encourage you to take a look at those and um, it saves you a little bit of money and time. Again, because we developed the MicroMasters to focus on practitioners, we realized that you want to get back out there and start applying these techniques into your business um, into your professional career. And so you might have an opportunity to actually continue doing that while attending one of these other universities. It's not possible to do that here at MIT. The curriculum is full-time. It's one additional semester, so you can't continue working. And you do have to be here for that spring semester. We do not offer it online. And so if you want to continue working during your uh, postgraduate education, then take a look at the Pathway Universities. Okay, so let's talk a little more about admissions. Admissions, the, the admissions deadline is December 15th, every year, uh, without fail, and we do not have a different admissions deadline for our MicroMaster students. It, you, as MicroMaster students, there is no differentiation between you and other students that are not doing the MicroMasters with one exception. And that exception is that we consider the MicroMasters transcript as a additional transcript to take a look at in judging the application, right? And so uh, if you have done well in the MicroMasters courses, it does help 
in the admissions process. You know, admission is not guaranteed, even if you do really, really well, because the admissions application judges lots of other aspects of a, an applicant's um, portfolio, including experience, why they want to do this, leadership development experiences. Uh, in other years, um, uh, the GRE and the TOEFL. This year specifically, we are not requiring the GRE because of the COVID-19 pandemic. That's the same as last year. So this is a unusual year in that you do not need to submit the GRE for your application to be considered. This is at least at the School of Engineering wide or certainly the Department of Mechanical Engineering. That's the case for all the admissions uh, criteria this year. And uh, on top of that are, of course, the reference letters. You know, what's different about the reference letters that we read for the MN versus the Master of Science is that we do encourage at least one letter from the university, but we actually do encourage mostly applications from previous employers or current employers um, to get a sense, again, of your work and your interest in manufacturing. And these are not uh, letters focused on research, obviously, that we are looking for um, the characteristics of a practitioner and what you want to do with, these, uh, with this degree if you were to get in. So again, think about the mission of the degree is to educate technical leaders in the manufacturing industry. How does that translate into what you are doing, what you want to do? How do you want to be a technical leader to do what? And so that, those are the kinds of things we're looking for in your essays and also in your um, reference letters. Uh, every year we um, have uh, a number of students that apply that have not finished the MicroMasters, and that's okay. If you have not finished the MicroMasters but are on track to finish the MicroMasters by about September of the following year, that's, um, that's okay. We, we consider your application like any other application. Now, the difference is, of course, that we have a limited transcript that we can see or that the admissions committee can see uh, uh, based on your current number of courses you have finished. So if you believe that you have a better chance of getting in because you will have finished the MicroMasters and we can see all the courses and you've done really well versus maybe having only completed one or two and you've done well, um, you know, I would encourage you to, to wait uh, to apply. But if you feel like you have a good profile or a, you want to see what the process is like, apply anyway, right? Um, it will only cost you the application process and you start getting your, your reference letters in, which I think is important. I'm often asked, well, what's the um, admissions rate to uh, MIT and specifically this program? It's uh, the admissions rate to the mechanical engineering department in the School of Engineering is about, uh, I believe, six to 7%, right? So it is very competitive, um, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't apply. If you don't apply, then the admissions rate is zero. Right. So um, it's, uh, we do look at, at the whole application. It's not just about grades. We look at the, um, at the essays, at the reference letters, and anything else you can send us in the portfolio. We, we think it's important to look at the whole person when doing admissions. Okay. Um, with that said, that's basically um, the admissions process. It's December 15th. And then we finish around uh, uh, letting people know around March. And then by April 15th, uh, we have to make a decision as to whether you're coming. And of course, if you're accepted and you have finished the MicroMasters, then you arrive here on campus, not in September, but in January, uh, usually in middle of January, although we encourage students to arrive here earlier, and then start working on the company at the end of January and towards um, the uh, summer, you start working full time at the company. The uh, work at the company is an academic project. It's a thesis. It is not considered uh, practical um, training or curricular practical training or OPT. 
uh, that is not a, um, uh, so it's not, it's not compensated, it's part of your academic work. However, we're often asked, does this program, uh, um, uh, does this count for OPT? The answer is no, unless you come here for the full year. So the rules for uh, optional practical training where as an international student, you can then go work for a company for a year. And because this program is STEM designated, you have the option of renewing for a second year. Um, the rules say that it has to be a one year program at minimum. Because of the way the MicroMasters is structured where you do not arrive on campus until January and the summer semester is not considered a full semester, um, this does not qualify for OPT. That being said, if you come to MIT and you have finished the MicroMasters and you arrive here in September, while we cannot reduce your tuition or the number of classes you can take, what happens in the fall semester is that you can take alternative classes. So um, you can actually be waived out of some of these classes, and then you can take different set of mechanical engineering manufacturing classes as well. And that would allow you to um, uh, use OPT for this. But um, you know, I know for most of you that's not an option or it's not something you're considering, but I did want to address that directly because that's a frequently asked question about OPT. Okay. With that, I am looking at the time. It's flown by. Let me turn to the questions and a DT. Yeah. Um, so the first question is, is work experience a mandatory criteria for admissions? Um, no, but it helps, right? Um, if we have a good sense that you understand what manufacturing is about, um, that usually comes from having some work experience. And so it's not mandatory, actually, I would say about in our current class, about half of the students come from directly from undergraduate, but many of them have had internship experience. Um, because of the practical nature of the degree, um, that aspect of knowing about manufacturing helps out. Is there a capacity limit for students to be accepted in the program? Uh, no, um, there's a practical limit of how many students we can fit in a laboratory, because especially the uh, 2810 and 2739 are uh, classes that require lots of hands-on work. And so there's probably a practical limit, but I would say that, um, in the practical limit, we look at every application and uh, I would say, um, for the most part, if we feel someone is uh, qualified, um, then we, we tend to favor acceptance. The practical limit, however, um, varies from year to year. This year, for example, because of the pandemic, uh, we have an oversubscription uh, over of students that deferred from last year, right? So we had to um, decrease that practical limit. Um, every year we have about a 15 to 25 students. And um, that is the practical limit depending on the year and uh, previous um, and other classes, um, we might have to reduce those. So I can't give you a hard number, um, but um, yeah, okay. Is MNG suitable for professionals that already have a BSc in mechanical engineering? Is MNG a low level qualification in US? Please, yeah, No, the MNG is actually a master's degree. So you have to have a bachelor's degree to attain the MEng, the Master of Engineering. And it's not a considered a low lower level qualification. How much will be the cost after the MicroMasters? There's two costs. Uh, tuition on a per semester basis is about $28,000 plus fees that I think add an additional thousand. So about 29,000 for tuition and fees. And then of course, there's living expenses, books, travel. And uh, I would 
you should budget about two two thousand five hundred per semester, right? And so we're talking about additional twenty thousand. So rough numbers, about fifty thousand dollars for the January through August time period. While I was applying, I didn't see any place to specify that I'm applying for the blended program and not the usual master's degree. Right, and that's actually on purpose. We do not, um, uh, we consider every student the same, right? The only difference, of course, you have a transcript from a additional set of classes um, that looks like another university to us when we think about it from the admissions process. And so you're applying for the MN based on um, your whole portfolio. And we do not take into account in the sense that you're applying for blended or not blended. You are admitted, if admitted, to the MH. The fact that then you finish the MicroMasters gives you that option of not coming during the fall semester and starting in January. And so it's a regular application. How has COVID affected teaching on campus? Oof. Um, last year we were all virtual. Um, it has, uh, it was quite a challenge as you can imagine. Um, and last year's cohort was all virtual. This year, because of vaccination um, and all MIT students are required to be vaccinated, and all MIT staff and faculty are also required to be vaccinated. We are doing everything in person. Uh, there are no capacity limits per se in the classrooms, but the difference is we all are wearing masks in the classroom. Uh, the only person that sometimes doesn't wear the mask is the instructor in the front of the room. Um, and so uh, for the most part, we're just being a little bit more careful, if you will, and even though we're all vaccinated, we're still wearing masks. And um, now the, we're required, even through, because we're vaccinated, we're still required to do COVID testing every week, at least once a week for um, you know, all the students and faculty and staff so that we can um, avoid any uh, clusters of infection. But that's about the only thing that's been affecting um, uh, uh, teaching. And MIT now. How's the current job demand for image graduates? Uh, it's very strong. <laughs> As you can imagine, especially because of supply chain issues, there's a lot of companies that are looking to expand their local manufacturing capacity. And because of the new technologies and the new ways of doing things, uh, they're looking for people that are interested and qualified. And what we have found is that um, not, not as many people are qualified as there are jobs. Um, and so it's a very strong market, I would say, for the image. Yeah. Is there a scholarship uh, to which we can apply for the program? Uh, there is a scholarship that is part of the program. You don't have to apply if admitted. It's, it's um, for the most part, automatic. And it's... Um, a $10,000 tuition only scholarship for any student that is not here on a fellowship. And um, the reason I'm very specific about that is, for example, there's some students that have support from their government or they might uh, have a um, fellowship from a uh, nonprofit or an NGO, et cetera, that covers their tuition and uh, sometimes a stipend of course, you have to apply for those individually. So here I'm thinking of like the Truman scholarships and so forth, right? Now, any student that's already here with full support is not eligible for that scholarship because by um, IRS rules, we are not able to give you additional money above and beyond the cost of tuition. However, for any student that is paying their own tuition, we do, uh, um, provide that $10,000 scholarship, but that's the only one. All other scholarships you have to search for on your own um, and outside. And um, most students actually get loans, um, private loans, either in their home country or sometimes here in the US, but uh, that's a very specific 
thing to each individual student. What is considered a good average percentage for each course of uh, MicroMasters for getting an admission to MH? Um, well, honestly, uh, I would say your average should be an A, right? Um, and, uh, and I say the average, right? Because we always, we realize it's eight courses and there may be sometimes uh, for whatever reason, you're, there's one course that you, um, you know, perhaps don't do as well at, but if we see that that's an aberration, that it's unusual and everything else looks great, um, we would consider that a good average. Um, yeah. Are fresher undergrad students compared directly with people with work experience or are yeah. they considered separately with a fixed ratio in class? No, they're considered the same, you know, the, um, which is obviously very challenging. Um, and it's, but we look again at the whole, uh, at the whole curriculum, at the whole experience, internships and the like. And so we do consider internships as kind of a form of experience. Um, I would say it's unusual, it would be very unusual that an undergraduate that's admitted has not had any internship experience. We think that's pretty important. Um, it, the academic record Otherwise, would it be stellar, and uh, the references would be stellar, and the essays would be stellar, but um, yeah, uh, without a kind of outside experience, um, it's unusual. How do I apply for transcripts from edX to send in for my uh, application? Somewhere in your profile, there's a button that says send to uh, partner school or to MIT, I can't remember. So it's actually in your edX account somewhere. You just hit that button and then we get the email directly. If I apply to get to know the admissions process, is it something you consider if I apply again next year? Yes, in some ways. Um, now, if every year is different, right? We look at the whole cohort, we look at all the applications and um, you're part of a, an application pool, if you will. And so um, if you don't get in, but then apply next year, we do take into account in this sense that we um, look at what's different this year versus last year. And some of it is you know, very specific to that year, the pool of students. Um, but the second is we want to see that something's changed. I think if there's, um, if you don't get in this year and apply next year, um, and we're looking for an improvement in some way uh, for the application. And so that can be an improvement in any of the categories I've mentioned. Um, so we do consider it that way. Will GRE and TOEFL be mandatory uh, requirement in future? Maybe for 2024? I, I have no idea. Honestly, we're doing going year by year and I don't have any insight into that uh, as well. And are TOEFL uh, IELTS mandatory this year? Yes, for any student that does not come from a US university or a US speaking uh, university in the sense that the, all the courses are US, I mean, English only. Uh, I believe there's only a couple exceptions to that. I think it's India, I believe. Um, I can't remember the other one. If I self report GRE scores, will it be looked at? Um, that's an interesting question. I would say, well, uh, the admissions committee might look at them, but I don't think they'll consider it. Um, uh, that area of our uh, admissions um, portal, I don't think will be uh, active, but you can still report it. It doesn't hurt um, if you think you have a great GRE, um, but um, I don't think I'll have much weight honestly this year. Which factors have the highest weightage when considered for admission? They're equally weighted, believe it or not. So I can't give you a, an answer of you know, focus on this, on that. It's a whole application. So I would say, think of it as equally weighted. 
In the supply chain micromasters, some of my friend completed the master's degree fully online via Arizona University. Can that happen with us? Uh, so no, so uh, this is part of that pathway program in the sense that each university has their own program. And uh, as a result, uh, in this case, I'd imagine the uh, Arizona University had an online option in general. MIT, for the most part, doesn't have online options. Um, none of our degrees are online. It just happens that we have this additional offering, if you will, of these courses that we consider for the equivalent of transfer credit. That's actually the mechanics of how this works is these courses, because they're very specific, are the only courses that we accept as transfer credit into our master's degree. Um, and so um, as a result, we don't have a fully online version of the MH degree. Is there any chance to connect to a path on smart manufacturing, maybe electric uh, courses? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, that's an area that we have been actively engaged in developing new courses and new seminars um, around it's more around data science. Obviously, uh, smart manufacturing includes the sensors and the hardware, not just the data and software, but it's within the overall curriculum. And so definitely that's, that's part of what we do. For someone who works in a smaller uh, chop shop environment, aerospace metal additive manufacturing facility with less than 10 people, what sort of value could the full program add versus the MicroMasters? Uh, it's a, I think, especially in a smaller environment where you're looking to I think every uh, job shop is very custom, obviously, by definition. Um, but some of the principles of uh, manufacturing around the physics, what you learn in 2810, what you learn in the design uh, courses, and then some of the, um, uh, I would say, management and business applications that are also part of your thesis. All these things can help you grow as a professional, but I think they also can help your company grow because um, even though it's small, I'm sure part of the vision is to make it larger, right? Um, and if it's not, it's not to grow larger, but to perhaps increase the value per piece or the value per project, that's also something we consider. And part of the value depends on the quality, the flexibility, uh, et cetera, that uh, you are offering the customer. And so you also learn about how to do that better. How many seats are reserved for MicroMasters students in MH program? Uh, none, actually. Again, we consider all the students equally, right? And so uh, there is no reserve for any one group in any way. And uh, we look at the whole cohort. Are there pathways between this 12 month MNG to a longer master's program in case mm -hmm. during the program one would get interested in continuing studying? Yeah, every year we have, um, you know, one or two students that are interested enough that they might want to go and do a second master's degree, for example, or alternatively might consider the PhD program it's unusual that uh, they get in um, right away, usually because you're going from a practical to a research type uh, environment. Uh, the students that uh, do go on to do these research degrees like a Master of Science or a PhD have uh, done some additional work, usually in a lab here at MIT or some other uh, place in research. And so then when they're applying, they, uh, their letters of recommendation, the references and their essays are a little bit different. They focus on research. And um, so there is no automatic admission to a longer degree. Uh, there is something we are now currently exploring 
hearing is it might be an option to extend for an additional semester for the data science option, but we're doing a pilot right now around that. Um, but it does not lead to a second degree, it just leads to a, uh, another semester, which is, you know, uh, I guess, if you're a regular MM student, it's a third semester, regular semester in the fall. If you're a uh, blended student, it's the spring and then the following fall after the summer. Um, so that's it right now. In regards to the design um, curriculum, are they purely product design subjects or are these design subjects focused from a manufacturing perspective? No, they're, uh, they're a combination. Um, it, we have different flavors of the product development and design courses, and some of them are very focused on the product. And there's one option that's focused on the whole process of product development, including understanding the design, the customer voice, and thinking about distribution, um, and then of course, end of life of the, of the product, et cetera. So it get a little bit different flavor depending on the option that you choose. We have a, another course that's focused on design for sustainability or design for scalability in emerging markets. Um, so it, especially that one has, I think, more options. If one's not happy with their MicroMasters grades, is it okay to not disclose it and reappear for those courses as part of MNG? Um, there's no option to do that, actually. <laughs> um, now, because uh, what you disclose is the whole transcript anyway. Um, so uh, I, that that I know of, and um, I would say, actually, you wouldn't want to do that. Let's say you are taking the course and you don't do so well, but then you improve. That actually is, I think, a positive thing, personally. Um, I wouldn't try to hide that. That I actually would be proud of the fact that you stuck with it and continued going. Is engineering uh, undergrad background a must for applying to MH? Yes. Um, it is a master's degree within the School of Engineering. And um, unless you have a, a background that has some of or most of the engineering courses, but you know, let's say for whatever reason, your degree does not say engineering, you just happen to take those courses, then um, it wouldn't, your application wouldn't be competitive otherwise. And here I'm thinking of, for example, um, um, analysis of mechanics, dynamics, uh, thermodynamics, uh, fluid dynamics. Um, so those are the kinds of courses we're looking for because those are the uh, things that we assume you already have and the, especially the physics-based classes, assume that when you're uh, analyzing uh, a material, you're able to use those concepts um, readily. And so sometimes for students that have not been in university for a little while, it takes, you know, you might need a refresher course on that and that's okay. Um, but definitely having the engineering background if not the degree is important. Um, but most students, I think, uh, have the degree. What is a typical student profile in this master's program? There's two types for the most part, um, uh, or two cohorts, I would say, of college students that come directly from undergraduate, and then the ones with most, more experience, I would say the average age is probably around 26, um, and the average age being kind of this combination, right, with students that are coming from undergraduate are 22, 23, and then we have another cohort that has a little bit more experience, they're probably around 27, 28. But we don't discriminate based on age, it just happens that those are the averages. Um, we, we're look, willing to look at the whole application. If you feel this program would benefit your career, would benefit the industry, well, I certainly encourage you to apply. Is the SMME program open for international applicants, or are we limited to apply for MNG? The Master of Science. So the Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering, uh, you're welcome to apply like any other program. Now keep in mind your MNG, 
your MicroMasters courses in no way um, can, are used for the Master of Science degree, right? So you can apply, you can submit your grades um, for the Master of Science application, but when you get here, they don't count for a semester, they don't, um, they don't waive you out of certain classes. It's, um, it would just be like an additional transcript. Um, and it's a very different application process that's focused on research versus practical application. Now, if you have research and you're interested in doing more practical application, yeah, and then the MEng is more um, appropriate, of course. But if it's you're just interested in research or perhaps just interested in teaching, um, I would say that the Master of Science is your, your better option, but the MicroMasters has no relevance or, uh, yeah, it has no bearing, I would say, in the admissions decision there. Is it possible to continue uh, post-grad studies in MIT after acquisition of a master's degree through this blended program? Yeah, yes, it's possible, but you have to reapply. Right now, of course, once you're here and if you do well, um, I think your chances of uh, being admitted um, are perhaps a little bit higher. Um, and so you can apply, um, as I mentioned, for example, some students, uh, very few, um, like one maybe every couple of years, apply for an additional master's or PhD. Um, and usually they have uh, taken some time off after they finished the MEng, done some uh, research work, and then apply the following year. But that's not necessarily um, uh, the case for everybody, but I'd say that's a pretty consistent um, path for those that choose that. But there's no automatic admission. Is there an interview for admissions? Um, yes. there. We do interviews. Now, there, uh, the challenge, of course, is that we have a limited number of uh, interview slots. And so um, uh, it, I think it depends a little bit on timing. Uh, but in general, the answer is yes. We do have interviews uh, for uh, students. And it's also an opportunity not only for the admissions committee to get to know this student, but also for the students to then ask questions, right? Um, so the answer is yes. Would it be an issue if someone finished their engineering degree more than 10 years ago, like from an yeah. admissions point of view? No, there's no issue. Um, we look at it the same. We, of course, then look at if you've done any additional education since then, or refresher or professional education. Um, but that's not necessarily a deal breaker. In addition, um, I think there we are looking at your professional career or the admissions committee is looking at your professional career and trajectory. Uh, given that level of experience, however, I might think um, the image certainly is uh, appropriate, but you also at that stage, if you're in a technical leadership role, um, at that point, you might also think about other programs at MIT, including uh, the Leaders for Global Operations um, and perhaps even an MBA or um, you know, Masters of uh, Technology in addition um, at other universities, because I think the, um, so, some of the concepts that we are focused on, you might have already kind of intuited in your experience. And so we've had students that have had that level of experience and what they've told us in a very positive way is that this allowed them to understand why things that they had an intuition were happening were happening based on the theory. And they allowed them then to teach others and make decisions based on data and theory, not just intuition or experience. And so in that way, it's very positive. Um, so um, you know, I would say it's not a problem for us, but also that level of experience opens up other uh, avenues and other academic uh, degrees. 
Yeah, the next question is somewhat based on that. Is there a path to continue to MBA? Not in this program, right? The MNG is self-contained um, for MBA. Some of the pathway schools actually are MBA. So I would uh, encourage you to take a look at the partner schools and, or the pathway schools uh, and see if there's a degree there that is appropriate. Some of them are a combination of kind of business and engineering, and some of them are just MBAs with kind of a concentration in the technical aspects of manufacturing. Anything else? I think that's it. Okay. Um, well, again, looking at um, my, my screen here, I, I see a lot of folks from different parts of the world. Uh, it's a pleasure, um, at least speaking to you, I do hope we get the opportunity to speak with each other. Um, I look for your application. And as uh, you saw in my introductory slide and now here, um, this is my email. Please feel free to send me an email. Um, and if you have any questions, um, I look forward to hearing from you. But otherwise, I look forward to getting your applications. Good luck. And whatever you do, but I do hope you apply. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.